at last, but we dragged through and sped away toward the setting sun. Next morning, just before dawn, when about 550 miles from St. Joseph, our mud wagon broke down. We were to be delayed five or six hours, and therefore we took horses by invitation and joined a noble sport galloping over the plain in the dewy freshness. <clears throat> and joined a party who were just starting on a buffalo hunt. It was noble sport galloping over the plain in the dewy freshness of the morning, but our part of the hunt ended in disaster and disgrace for a wounded buffalo bull chased the passenger Bemis nearly two miles, and then he forsook his horse and took to a lone tree. He was very sullen about the matter for some 24 hours, but at last he began to soften little by little, and finally he said, Well, it was not funny, and there was no sense in those gawks making themselves so facetious over it. I tell you, I was angry and earnest for a while. I should have shot that long, gangly lubber they called Hank if I could have done it without crippling six or seven other people. <laughs> but of course I could. The old Alan so confounded comprehensive. I wish those loafers had been up in the tree. They wouldn't have wanted to laugh so. If I had had a horse with a scent, but no. The minute he saw that buffalo bull wheel on him and gave a bellow, he raced straight up in the air and stood on his heels. The saddle began to slip, and I took him round the neck and laid close to him and began to pray. Then he came down and stood up on the other end a while, and the bull actually stopped pawing sand and bellowing to contemplate the inhuman spectacle. Then the bull made a pass at him and uttered a bellow that sounded perfectly frightful. It was so close to me, and that seemed to literally prostrate my horse's reason and make a raving, distracted maniac of him. And I wish I may die if he didn't stand on his head for a quarter of a minute and shed tears. He was absolutely out of his mind. He was as sure as truth itself, and he really didn't know what he was doing. Then the bull came charging at us, and my horse dropped down on all fours and took a fresh start. And then for the next ten minutes he would actually throw one hand spring after another so fast that the bull began to get unsettled too and didn't know where to start in. And, he, and so he stood there sneezing and shoveling dust over his back and bellowing every now and then and thinking, thinking he had got a $1,500 circus horse for breakfast certain. Well, I was first out on his neck, the horses, not the bulls, and then underneath and next on his rump and sometimes head up and sometimes heels. But I tell you, it seemed solemn and awful to be ripping and tearing and carrying on so in the presence of death, as you might say. Pretty soon the bull made a snatch for us and brought away some of my horse's tail, I suppose, but do not know, being pretty busy at the time. But something made him hungry for solitude and suggested to him to get up and hunt for it. And then you ought to have seen that spider-legged old skeleton go, and you ought to have seen the bull cut out after him, too, head down, tongue out, tail up, bellowing like everything, and actually mowing down the weeds and tearing up the earth, and boosting up the sand like a whirlwind. By George, it was a hot race. I and the saddle were back on the rump, and I had the bridle in my teeth and holding on to the pommel with both hands. First we left the dogs behind, then we passed a jackass rabbit. Then we overtook a coyote and were gaining on an antelope when the rotten girth let go and threw me about 30 yards off to the left. And as the saddle went down over the horse's rump, he gave it a lift with his heels that sent it more than 400 yards up in the air. I wish I may die in a minute if he didn't. I fell at the foot of the only solitary tree there was in nine counties adjacent, as any creature could see with the naked eye. And the next sound I had hold, and the next second I had hold of the bark with four seat, sets of nails in my teeth. And the next second after that I was astraddle of the main limb and blaspheming my luck in a way that made my breath smell of brimstone. I had the bull now, if he did not 
think of one thing, but that one thing I dreaded. I dreaded it very seriously. There was a possibility that the bull might not think of it, but there were greater chances that he would. I made up my mind what I would do in case he did. I was a little over 40 feet in the gr to the ground from where I sat. It was a little more, over 40 feet to the ground from where I sat. I cautiously unwound the lariat from the pommel of my saddle. Your saddle? Did you take your saddle up in the tree with you? Take it up in the tree with me? Why, how you talk? Of course I didn't. No man could do that. It fell in the tree when it came down. Oh, exactly. Certainly. I unwound my lari the lariat and fastened one end of it to the limb. It was the very best green rawhide and capable of sustaining tons. I made a slip noose in the other end and then hung it down to see the length. It reached down 22 feet, halfway to the ground. I then loaded every barrel of the Allen with a double charge. I felt satisfied. I said to myself, if he never thinks of that one thing that I dread, all right. But if he does, all right anyhow. I am fixed for him. But don't you know the very thing a man dreads is the thing that always happens? Indeed it is so. I watched the bull now with anxiety, anxiety with which no one can conceive of who has not been in such a situation, and felt that at any moment death might come. Presently a thought came into the bull's eye. I knew it, said I. If my nerve fails now, I am lost. Sure enough, it was just as I had dreaded. He started in to climb the tree. What, the bull? Of course, who else? But a bull can't climb a tree. He can't, can he? Since you know so much about it, did you ever see a bull try? No, I never dreamt of such a thing. Well then, what is the use of your talking that way then? Because you never saw a thing done. Is that any reason why it can't be done? Well, all right, go on. What did you do? The bull started up and got along well for about 10 feet, then slipped and slid back. I breathed easier. He tried it again, got up a little higher, slipped again, but he came at it once more, and this time he was careful. He got gradually higher and higher, and my spirits went down more and more. Up he came, an inch at a time, with his eyes hot and his tongue hanging out. Higher and higher, hitched his foot over the stump of a limb, and looked up as much as to say, You are my meat, friend. Up again, higher and higher, getting more excited the closer he got. He was within ten feet of me. I took a long breath, and then I said, It is now or never. I had the coil of the lariat already. I paid it out slowly till it hung right over his head. All of a sudden, I let go of the slack, and the slip noose fell fairly round his neck. Quicker than lightning, I out with the allen and let him have it in the face. It was an awful roar and must have scared the bull out of his senses. When the smoke cleared away, there he was, dangling in the air. 20 foot from the ground, and going out of one convolution and in, into another faster than you could count. I didn't stop to count anyhow. I shinnied down the tree and shot for home. Bemis, is all that true, just as you have stated it? I wish I may rot in my tracks and die the death of a dog if it isn't. Well, we can't refuse to believe it, and we don't. But if there were some proofs... Proofs? Did I bring back my lariat? No. Did I bring back my horse? No. Did you ever see the bull again? No. Well, then, what more do you want? I never saw anybody as particular as you are about a little thing like that. I made up my mind that if this man was not a liar, he only missed it by the skin of his teeth. The episode reminds me of an in incident of my brief sojourn in Siam years afterward. 
The European citizens of a town in the neighborhood of Bangkok had a prodigy among them by the name of Eckhart, an Englishman, a person famous for the number, ingenuity, and imposing magnitude of his lies. They were always repeating his most celebrated falsehoods and always trying to draw him out before strangers, but they seldom succeeded. Twice he was invited to the house where I was visiting, but nothing could seduce him into a specimen lie. One day a planter named Bascom, an influential man and a proud and sometimes irascible one, invited me to ride over with him and call on Eckhart. As we jogged along, said he, now do you know where the fault lies? It lies in putting Eckhart on his guard. The minute the boys go to pumping at Eckhart, he knows perfectly well what they are after, and of course he shuts up his shell. Anybody might know he would, but when we get there, we must play him finer than that. Let him shape the conversation to suit himself. Let him drop it or change it whenever he wants to. Let him see that nobody is trying to draw him out. Just let him have his own way. He will soon forget himself and begin to grind out lies like a mill. Don't get impatient, just keep him, and let me play him. I will make him lie. It does seem to me that the boys must be blind to overlook such an obvious and simple trick as that. <laughs>